is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Season 4, Episode 8, I'm Not the Person I Used to Be. In this episode, Greg comes back, but not exactly, and I don't know what to make of the choice they made here. Is this just practical, or is it metaphorical? Is it both? What happened? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Lauren for commissioning this episode. Um, I'm sorry about, I, there was a live uh, voyeur commission for this one, which means that people get to hang out with me and watch my reactions as I watch this episode for the first time. And unfortunately, there were some problems with Crowdcast and it wound up getting like cut off and all of these issues. And uh, I apologize to everybody for the fact that they really didn't get their money's worth on that voyeur episode. I'm sorry. Um, but it was a really fun one to do. And I can understand why people wanted to see my reaction to this. And honestly, I feel like my reaction was just sort of nonplussed. It wasn't even me going like, oh, shit, what? It was like, wait, what are they doing? Hold on a second. And I maintain that is the correct response. I really want to know you guys and help me out here. Is this a choice they made because they couldn't get the original actor back? Or is it a choice that they made simply to really hammer home a point? Or did they make it because it was a practical choice and they decided to hammer home the point and, and built the story around the fact that it was like they weren't going to be able to get the original actor back? Like, I'm, I'm just very curious what came first the the bit or the idea. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Lauren says, I liked our convo at the end. Totally worth the moolah. I love that you just said moolah, Lauren. I have not heard that in a minute. Um, but good. I'm glad because I felt bad about that. So first of all, I'm going to say up front, I really like the concept of this. Because this is a true thing that happens, especially the, the age that Rebecca is supposed to be at, what she's supposed to be like 23, 24, something like that, maybe older, I can't remember. I feel like my idea of how old she's supposed to be varies all the time on this show. But she isn't quite 30, at the very least. And when you're in your mid 20s, you are really still figuring out a lot. And you change so much as a person from 25 to 35. It's like you change nearly as much in that span of time as you do from like 10 to 20. And it's not a physical change necessarily, although that can be part of it, but your ideas of the world and your understanding, like just, it just shapes so much of how you see the rest of the world. And it's really shocking when you look back at who you were, because you thought at the time, okay, I'm a grown up now, at least in theory, even if you knew I'm not really, you kind of still, you thought that you had yourself mostly figured out. And then you, you reach 31, 32 and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, nothing that I thought was important to me is still important to me. All of these things that I never really understood or cared about now are uh, very high on my priorities list. I thought I believed X, Y, Z, and it turns out that was horseshit. A lot changes. And you also begin to get perspective on yourself because you have had enough experience in life that you actually have some things to look back on and judge from afar. You just don't have that. When you're a teen, you're experiencing romance for the first time, perhaps. 
and it's your first time. You have no basis for how any of it works beyond what people have told you and what you see in media, which is very, very unhelpful as it turns out. So once you reach 30, you've gone through a lot of relationships and that might be romantic or it might be platonic. Either way, you can step back and look at a series of relationships that you've had with people throughout your life at that point and see some commonalities if you have that introspection and begin to realize what your fucking patterns are. And that is simply not available information to you before that age. So right around 30 becomes when you start to settle more into who you are as a person and learn more about the way that you interact with the world, some of your biggest flaws and how to maybe countermand those, maybe not. And so this sort of thing, running into somebody that you used to know who seems like a completely different person, and maybe you seem like a completely different person to them, actually is almost literally true because it will feel like, oh my God, you're like not the same at all. Wow. On the other hand, you can run into people and be like, you are, you haven't changed since high school. This is really bad. And that's what I find really fun about this episode is that we get Greg, who is completely recast and literally a different person, versus Josh, who is the same person he was in high school and hasn't grown at all. And that's part of his issue, right? Um, and, and he's clinging to it because it was a great time for him. And as somebody who had mostly a pretty good time in high school, I can understand that temptation. You know, it's like this tiny little pond and you're a big fish and it makes you feel good and you get constant validation. But Josh, buddy, when you're in high school, everybody liking you means something because that's very, like, that's real material social clout. That's power in that community. You're out of high school now, man. It's been 12 years. You don't have that clout anymore. Like the crowd seems to enjoy him, but there's a sense of like, they're laughing at you. You know that, right? You know, and I can't tell if that's true. I think it is. And I can't tell how much of that he seems to catch on to because I don't think he does at all. And Josh, it's time for you to figure out who you are beyond this very small experience that you had that you just seem to think defines you as a person. And you've lived over a decade since. A lot has happened to you. You shouldn't be running back to that the way that you are. So it's sort of fun. I'm not the person I used to be. It's like with Josh, it turns out that that is in it. It's true in a way that he didn't even know about. He wasn't ever really the prom king, as it turns out. That's a great twist, by the way. Hector reveals this in a moment of peak. Um, and I have to say, somebody mentioned in the chat how different Hector is now to how he was at the beginning of the series. I can honestly say I don't remember Hector that well from the beginning of the series, except for the fact that he was like completely unreliable and felt like the most like a teenager out of everybody which is really saying something comparing him to Josh. Um, but Hector, it, it's the first time I think that anybody has straight up said, Josh is annoying. And I kind of appreciated that somebody just said that shit. Cause like Josh is enjoyable in his way, but you know what? Josh is like, a shot of pucker in a drink, you know, we're like, okay, a little bit of this is fun. It adds a something and it makes this go down smoother. It's just a little bit more enjoyable to drink right now, but like too much of this is going to make me sick. And this drink shouldn't really need this to be good. And probably just next time I'm not going to do this. Josh is a good hearted guy that, otherwise feels so undeveloped to me that I want to like put him in a cask and nail it shut and leave him somewhere on a vineyard because boy needs to age hard. He really does. So 
just Hector saying Josh is annoying. And he says it to white Josh, who does not argue with him at all. This is honestly something that Josh needs to hear somebody say. And there, it, it kind of does happen when Hector confronts him and tells him you weren't actually prom king. That's basically what he's being told is like, you're annoying and like you've been throwing this in our face and you're a dick for it. And also not as many people liked you as you thought. But also, I feel like this is something that it would be very easy to write off this one incident and not look at it as like indicative of who he is as a whole. And I want him to see it as who he is as a whole, because this sort of vibe is what he brings to the table a lot. Now, saying that, the opening of this episode is him cooking for Rebecca and being like a sweet guy that's getting her really she's getting the heart eyes a little bit with him again. Um, and he made her matzo brie. I'm going to look this up because I don't know what this is. Um, but she says it's usually either too crunchy or hella soggy. Uh, is a dish of Ashkenazi Jewish origin made from matzah fried with eggs. It is commonly eaten as a breakfast food during the Jewish holiday of Passover a bready thing with eggs. It's sort of like huevos rancheros or leftover dumplings and eggs. Honestly, that sounds banging. I am a big fan of eggs. So I kind of would like to try this, but matzah is basically like saltines. I guess I have the like ingredients for that. Um, but yeah, not only does he make her breakfast and he makes it really well, which considering what we saw of him last episode, this is growth for him. So I should give him more credit for that. But I I can't endorse it entirely because she is getting heart eyes for him and I do not want her to do that. That's part of my bias here is I don't want to give him credit for being like a good guy because I feel like she can hear me. And then she's going to be like, yeah, see, that's why I'm acting this way. I'm like, no, Rebecca, stop. No, don't do it. Um. <laughs> I love this with him doing like the, um, the, what do you call it? I'm, I'm trying to remember what these resistance bands in this scene. This is so amazing to watch him doing this in the middle of the kitchen. It's just a weird, <laughs> this is why I'm not in better shape because it would not occur to me after just finishing making food to just like suddenly bust out a workout in the middle of the same kitchen that's full of dirty dishes. And I stand by that as something that I wouldn't think of, but I also don't look like Josh Chan and I do regret that a bit. So maybe I should try and incorporate a little bit more of what he's like into my life. I don't know. There's a lot of adjustments that I could make. Let's be honest. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, when she says that this is so good and she stops and she says, but Derry's tough on me. Um, and he says, Oh, I got you covered. The poopery and the arts and leisure section of the New York Times are waiting in the bathroom for later. And she says, oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. And she apologizes for stinking up the bathroom the other day. He says, it made my eyes tear up, but I needed a good cry. And this is part of what she cites later as like the fact that he's being generous to her and also okay with her bodily functions. This is something that I think guys really underestimate in terms of like, what women are pleasantly surprised by. And I say that as somebody who is engaged to a man who hates when I fart. Listen, I'm sorry. I also hate it. I don't want to be here for this, but what can you do? And I understand. I don't like, he tries not to do it around me either. He is not a hypocrite about it. So I give him full points for that. But a lot of women feel like men are only interested in us as sex objects. And the men are real people who shit and barf and fart. Guys are suddenly like, oh my God, ew, oh, because they don't want a full person. They just want somebody that they can have sex with and enjoy looking at. And that's like it. And unfortunately, that is true of a lot of guys. It's uh, we we are not meant to like have hair growth in places that they don't approve of. We are not meant to wear more or less makeup than they like. 
We are not meant to have bodily functions, bodily odors, none of this. So I can really understand why him embracing like the fact that she uses the bathroom and it's occasionally horrible as she's seeing this as like an endearing thing and sort of unusual. And I'm like, ah, you know what? I get it. It's not something that would work for me necessarily, but I'm not saying I would like, I, I wouldn't be offended or upset by it. I don't know that it would make me get hard eyes like she does, but this also doesn't tend to be a massive problem for me. And I'm lucky in that way. So maybe that's part of it too, is I've never been, super self-conscious in the first place in this regard. And so it's not something that I've like got a little bit of an expectation of like, Oh, he's going to be a dick about this, you know? Um, anyway, cause Owen, he gets very angry about the fact that he hates when I fart around him, but for some reason, and we both don't understand why my farts have no smell at all. And he gets really angry about that because he says that I already like, am so disdainful of people and uh, have a superiority complex sometimes. And the fact that my farts literally don't stink is like so close to my shit don't stink that he finds that very offensive, that it's something that I can say and be dead serious and correct about. He doesn't like it. He's like, yeah, you already feel too good about yourself about certain things. You don't need this on top of it. And I'm like, mm, I, I do see your point, but it's kind of awesome. I, it's very nice for me. Because that means that if I'm quiet, I can fart wherever and nobody knows it's happening. Lucky. It's very helpful. I, I've used it a lot in my life, I'm just saying. So, Rebecca, she's having her smitten moment. And then she's at work. And she's talking to AJ about how she had this moment with Josh this morning. And then she sees Nathaniel come in. And he's talking to the security guard at the front about that man's daughter's soccer game and talking about how he's going to bring the orange slices. And Rebecca has another moment of, Oh my God, this guy and AJ sort of mocks her. And it's really funny. Ooh, you like Nathaniel. I really enjoy AJ. Um, this bit that Nathaniel says, which is she always brings the oranges room temperature. Everybody knows you got to slice them and ice them. Look, Nathaniel, I've said a lot of things about you. I've talked a lot of shit and I stand by all of that, but you won me over with this one. You're right. And everybody should know you're right. Everybody should slice and ice. Who wants a room temperature orange? Nobody. Cold oranges only especially when you've just been out on the field, working your butt off, scoring three goals. You deserve a cold orange slice and don't let anybody tell you different. So she has this moment again and she sort of panics and she texts Paula. Paula, for her part, is extremely distracted talking to her new pet bunny, Kamala Harris. Kamala do you know I haven't heard her name like said out loud by people who know? I'm realizing everything I've seen about her, I've been like reading or it's been friends and I'm not convinced that they know how to pronounce her name. Is it Kamala or Kamala? I'm saying Kamala because of like Dark Tower, actually, I think. Anyway, it's a great pun name. I really enjoy pun names for pets. I find them endearing and adorable. Um, and <laughs> she says, you're the perfect replacement for Brendan a great listener, and you didn't ruin my vagina. Um, so Paula basically for the duration of this episode is like out of commish. She's dealing with her studies and she doesn't get any of Rebecca's texts. So Rebecca has to sort of muddle through everything and she's updating Paula the whole time, but Paula doesn't see any of it until the very end, which I actually really liked that bit where she finds all of the texts all at once. And it's just fun to see her like reacting to it in real time. That's how it is. Like when somebody has gone through a bunch of shit and they've left you a bunch of texts, that's just what it's like. It's a roller coaster to read it finally. So then we go to the uh, high school reunion and it turns out that Heather's like running it because it's at home base, which is a great bit. I like that. And 
I love when she says, oh, my God, how long are you back for to Valencia? And Valencia says the rest of the series of holidays, I mean, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Uh, and later on, eventually, there's the whole um, Valentine's Day is the final day of and like, oh, of course, that makes sense for this all to like wrap up on that day. That did not co- like occur to me, but it really does. And it makes me a little sad that like Valentine's Day at this point is over. And I could have come like fairly close to wrapping up the show right around Valentine's Day, which would have been fun. I always regret when a show has like seasonal episodes that I wasn't able to like match them up with my coverage. You know, it's so unimportant and nobody cares, but it's the kind of thing that for me, it would have been really fun. Like I love watching the doctor who Christmas episodes when it's actually Christmas. It's super fun. Um, Rowan says, uh, Kamala, all the A sounds are pronounced the same way. Okay. Kamala. Um, Lauren says, I adore the series jokes because I was so worried she wouldn't be in the rest of the show. Yeah, when she left, I was kind of wondering if they were going to do that. And I'm really glad that they found a way to like bring her back in. Also, I'm I'm interested, like, because Greg says that he's going to be back until like Valentine's Day as well, I think. And I didn't expect him to continue to be around. And obviously he isn't. It's a different actor. So it's sort of a weird thing. Um, but if he is, all right, let me, let me get to that. So this, this whole thing, first of all, we've got Valencia dealing with what turns out to be like a tragic star cross lovers bit. This is one of those things that I can't decide if I buy it. What it turns out was going on was she cheated on Josh in high school with Father Bra. And he told her eventually that she needed to choose between him or Josh. And she chose him and she wrote him a note and told him to meet her under the bleachers after school. She left the note in his letter jacket. And as it turns out, he like lost the jacket, never got her note, never showed up. And he figured that she had made her choice when she just continued going out with Josh and he never heard from her again. And she figured that he wasn't interested and that's why he never showed up. So there's this whole thing. And it's great because Heather is able to read Valencia well enough that she figures out the majority of what's going on here. She's mostly correct, but she incorrectly guesses the gender of the person that she was involved with. She thinks it was the first girl that Valencia has ever hooked up with. And so she's going around the party all night, pointing out all of the different women in the room, asking if it's them. And then eventually the whole thing with the letter jacket comes up because it turns out Hector had a bunch of people stuff in the trunk of his car for 12 years and never returned any of it. One of the things was the letter jacket and they are going to figure out a whole heist to get it back before Father Bra sees it, they fail. And Father Bra reads it. And this leads to a bit of a moment where they go aside in, like, I guess the break room. And they are talking to one another about the reality of their situation right now. Because she's in a committed relationship and she's pretty happy. And he is also, as he puts it, in a committed relationship. Oh my God, I forgot. They're, they're in like the break room and there's lockers. So he's literally standing at his locker and he puts on his letter jacket again. I forgot how like completely on the nose this is. It's amazing. So essentially they decide that they are going to just take comfort in the fact that they felt the same way about each other, but they've moved on and they have other lives now and they have to just be okay with that. And Heather is like so delighted. I love her saying to Valencia, forgive me, I bumped my desk there. Um, I'm an old married lady now and there is no relationship drama left for me. And Valencia's like, you've been married for like two minutes. And she says, yeah, and we're really happy, but there's no drama. And I love drama. (laughs) 
Listen, girl. Same. It's one of those things where I love it, except that every time I come across it, I'm so thankful that I don't have to deal with it anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, simultaneously, I'm super interested, but I'm also very relieved to be a full grown woman with a fucking like future husband who doesn't have to. It's a lot of energy. And anybody who is still out there trying to like, if you're interested in having like a long term relationship, and you haven't found the person, you have my sympathies, because I can only imagine how exhausting that shit is as you get older. It was plenty exhausting when I was younger. And just good God, it's just men are too headache, honestly. So I I really sympathize with Heather on this. And especially because this involves somebody that she's like, actually likes. And then it involves Father Bra, who's also somebody that she likes. And it's a big shock. She really thought that it was just going to be like, Oh, my God, you know, your first like lesbian crush. And I'm going to get to find out about this person. And then it turns out that it's somebody that she knew the whole time. That's a big twist. So when I said earlier, I'm not sure if I buy it. What I really mean is, there was never any tension between Valencia and Father Bra. Like, and I say that with a full understanding. I don't know how many scenes we've ever even seen of them together, but I would have loved if there was a little something that like was a bit of a breadcrumb to let us know. That said, uh, what a fucking champ Father Bra is to be like giving Josh guidance on how to get through his relationship with the woman that he was in love with, who like just chose Josh over him. Like, yikes. Um, and that must have been hard, especially since Josh was like in the midst of cheating on her eventually, you know, but he also knew that Valencia had cheated on Josh. So maybe that was some comfort to him in its way. So that was a fun little bit. Um, it doesn't like wind up meaning a lot, but it's fun. And then we have the whole thing with Josh and oh my God, he comes in, he greets everybody at this reunion by name, and then he does a handstand and it's just so unnecessary. Oh my God, this guy, like, what are you even doing? Jo- White Josh off to the side saying, handstand on the entry, sweet. Will it be at the full floor routine within the hour? Oh, White Josh, I love how sardonic you are. You're one you're probably like one of my top three favorite characters um he says the king is here and does like a little trumpet thing and oh my god the looks on both their faces he wants to make the welcome speech and he even just straight up says to hector don't you think they want to hear from me more than you it's just so incredibly tactless oh I, I I just hate Josh so much in this scene. And the way that Hector reacts is so good. He does this, like, thrusts his, like, lower jaw out and blinks really slowly at Josh, which is just an, a very excellent... That's a good face. That's a good face. Um, and Rebecca is here because she's, like, bringing some pretzels, I guess? Maybe? I don't remember exactly why she's here. She's got a sheet tray of something, but they don't look like pretzels. Maybe they're like uh, little baby sausages or something. I'm trying to see. Are they pretzels? It's hard to tell. Regardless, she comes running up to Valencia and Heather, panicking about the whole thing with uh, having feelings for Josh and Nathaniel again. And she's asking them, which one do you think that I'm supposed to be with? And... They both say, actually, we sort of thought that you're meant to be was Greg. And she's just floored by this. Now, I am really curious. Do did they have both of them say you're meant to be with Greg? Because that's what the audience has been saying over the course of this show airing. That's the vibe that I got because of how Valencia says everyone thinks that, duh. It feels like they're reacting to like the fans and the way that the fans like constantly felt 
the two of them were destined to eventually get back together after they had worked out their own shit. And I'm curious if that's just me projecting or if that's actually what was going on here. I feel very much like Rebecca does where just Greg, just like (sighs) really what it comes down to is how much Greg has managed to work through his own shit because Greg, they were both frankly too much of a mess. And I don't feel like Rebecca's in a particularly good place to be starting a relationship at this point anyway, personally, I say that with a full understanding that like most of us aren't in great places when we start relationships. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't try that. We don't have the right to be happy, but just, I feel like she's, things have been volatile for her, you know, and I just kind of want her to just have some time to herself for a a little bit longer. And I think part of that problem for me comes from the fact that it's difficult on this show for me to exactly like, gauge how much time has passed between events. Having the holidays is like a helpful marker, actually. Um, But you know, like her suicide attempt was meant to be in the middle of the summer, I guess. So the Halloween episode was like, several months after that had happened. And now we're getting towards Christmas. So it's been maybe like six months. I think I feel like that's not enough time you know? And I don't really know how Greg is doing and how much he has changed. The whole bit about him being literally a different person. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Doesn't work for me. I don't like it. I don't find it that funny. I don't find this actor to be charming. Actually, I find him very flat and uninteresting. And I am so distracted throughout his performance by the feeling that he's attempting to imitate Greg instead of just being a real person of his own. And it just didn't work for me. I just, it didn't connect. I didn't even feel like the two of them had any chemistry, really. You know, it, it wasn't even like, because then I could forgive that if it was like, well, I don't really see it for this guy, but when the two of them are on screen together, fireworks, you know, this totally makes sense. She had great chemistry with Greg. And that was part of why, despite the fact that they were like bad for each other, you did kind of root for them. She does not have that with this guy. He feels like a cardboard cutout to me. He's like attractive and he has a good voice, but I don't have any charisma coming off him at all. It's just nothing. And I don't know if that's just me or what, but I know that when I was watching this, Owen like was walking around and he came in and he had already watched this episode without me. And um, I was rewatching it this afternoon and he popped his head and was like, Oh, I hate this guy. And I was like, okay, yeah, thank you. Because I also I'm not feeling it. And I couldn't tell if it was just like kind of the shock of it and how weird it was when I was watching it the first time. But upon rewatch, I stand by it. I don't think this was a good choice. And, you know, again, I don't really know what went into the, the choice to do this in the first place to recast Greg at all. Was it because the other actor wasn't available? Um, And if so, you could have picked anybody to replace him. And why this dude? Like, I just don't feel like he looks vaguely like Greg, I guess. But I'm sure there's like, Greg is a very sort of like, his looks are, at, you know, average height, dark hair, white, round faced male or oval faced. There's a lot of dudes out there that look like that. I, they could have found anybody. I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm bummed about it. Because it's a major part of this episode and because of the fact that he said that he's like going to be back for the rest of the series and I want to warm to him and it might happen that, you know, that has been known to happen. I'll be not into somebody and gradually I'll be like, okay, you know what? I've turned a corner and they're great. I hope that happens because as of right now, I'm just kind of like, can we like spend no more time on this, please? I don't like it. I don't. 
and the chemistry thing is also it's a difficult thing to quantify because some people will say that actors have chemistry and I don't see it. So it's also feels like it's a kind of a subjective thing. And I don't know if other people watching felt like that. You know, like I said, her chemistry with Greg is just so palpable that it makes up for a lot of the the problems with their relationship and the things that you are like, yeah, that doesn't work actually. Um, and there's just something that, like, for example, on Schitt's Creek, um, David and Patrick, I mean, the chemistry between them is so off the charts that the instant David sits down at Patrick's desk and begins speaking to him, I like sat up and turned and looked at Owen and was like, oh my God, are they going to be a thing? It was just immediate. You like, it, you know, it was so palpable. And oh God, it's like a black hole between her and him on this. I just, the whole little cute song about it's nice to meet you because he didn't work for me. The song didn't work for me. I wanted to be invested and I wasn't. I feel bad about it. Because like, th it's not often that this show misfires so completely for me on something that they're trying to do that's like, a little different. And it's not even the recast that's the problem. It's who they chose. The recast itself might actually be a fun and interesting idea. But I don't really feel like you needed to go with like a name actor necessarily. I had hardly seen anybody on this show before. A lot of people on here are new faces. And it would have been kind of nice for somebody else to get a shot, you know? Um, Rowan says, yeah, they couldn't get Santino back. He was busy on Broadway, I believe. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just, the, the, her conflict this episode with whether or not to tell Greg that she slept with his dad I was thankful for that, at least, because it added some investment for me in whether or not she said anything, just because we know what happened there and how low she was and what a terrible situation it was and how bad she feels about it. So I really did care what she chose, mostly because I knew it was going to affect how she saw herself. And I want Rebecca to feel good about herself. And so I wanted her to make the right choice and to tell him because I felt like she isn't going to be able to sleep at night if she doesn't tell him and she tries to just keep talking to him and act like this never happened. So in that respect, I was engaged. But in terms of like the will they won't they, I really don't want them to please no, I don't know. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. That's all I'm going to say about it. Um, I think I said a while back that I hope for the finale of this episode to be Rebecca single and for their guy to like not be a factor at all. Um, so yeah. And she, the, the whole, it's nice to meet you is a bit that is done at her pretzel shop and she is showing it to him to like, you know, just bring him up to speed on what's going on in her life. And she finds out as they're talking that he has been back in, in West Covina a few times. And he has told people to not tell her because he felt weird about it and he didn't really want to see her. And she's a little bit like saddened and weirded out by it, but she also seems to get it and doesn't really blame him for it. You know, it's just sort of a bummer. And uh, then she says, you know, I'm doing this thing where I try and tell people and be honest with them. And he says, I don't think we should do that. How about we just clean slate it? You said that I seem like a completely different person to you. So how about we just act like we have never met and just start fresh? And of course, when you're dreading telling somebody something, you're going to welcome that suggestion. You know, it makes sense that she's like, okay. But you can sense, despite the fact that she's saying, okay, there is a part of her that knows, like, maybe this isn't really the best way to handle this, though. Like, he's inviting this, but that's because he doesn't know what it is that I was going to tell him. And she texts Paula throughout this, eventually coming back around and, like, being like, never mind, never mind, never mind. Uh, I am going to tell him because he tells her that his father wants to talk to him. 
And it sounded like from the way that he was, uh, from the tone of his voice, that it was not going to be good news. So uh, (laughs) she assumes that his dad was going to tell him about the fact that they slept together. I am very curious whether that was actually the case. Because she assumes that's what it is. And I mean, if I were her, I also would assume that. I, I mean, God, you know. But I would find it pretty amusing if she told him because she assumed his father was going to spill the beans. And then he goes to see his dad after this. And his dad had no intention of saying anything. And it's just like, oh, my God, why did she have to blab Jesus Christ? And Gray sort of, he does a thing where he can't believe that she would fuck his dad, of course. But also... He does admire the fact that she decided to tell him, and it's clearly for him an indication that she is growing a little bit as a person, that he says it it must have been hard and it was actually pretty brave. And it's a nice moment, you know, because he doesn't have to forgive her. That's not like the prerequisite there. But I do like the idea of... Being able, as much as you're angry with somebody, to appreciate that this was growth and to be able to like see past your personal hurt to the bigger picture of what's going on here. Um, and yeah, this, this whole storyline, it basically just ends with him leaving and her sort of standing there like, I think feeling good that she told him. She knows she did the right thing. But also a little bit despondent because her friends had said they thought that he was her meant to be and she doesn't really know what to do with that. Um, So now we're going to double back and we're going to talk a little bit more about Josh Chan. Now, I said how little patience I had for him this episode and that stands. But then there's a pretty great bit after he finds out that he's not actually prom king where he goes and he sits down in a corner of the bar and it turns out that there was a magic club at school. And he had no idea. And it's a a nice moment for Josh because he is really actually kind of a dork. He's like got all the markers of being a super jock. But the fact that he's into magic and that his friends like mocked him for it doesn't surprise me at all. That's because so much of what Josh is about is, is like being a little boy. So the jock aspect is really more like Josh likes to play outside. Josh likes karate. You know, it's just like, it's not even the jock thing. He's not doing it for the the toxic masculinity aspect of proving that he's a man. It's because he's just like super excited. He's so, he's got so much energy and he just needs to go do stuff. So like the aspect of him being into magic, I mean, it's like finding out he was into dinosaurs. Yeah. Josh Chan was definitely into dinosaurs, is still into dinosaurs to this day. It would not surprise me in any way at all. And when he finds out that there was a magic club, he's like, well, can I hang out with you guys? And they are not super welcoming to him because they feel he is trying to take their thing away from him. But George, who it turns out he went to high school with, is advocating for him. And... This leads to one of my favorite songs that this show has done, actually. What You Missed While You Were Popular, which this is something that doesn't get talked about as often as it deserves. And it is the fact that nerds get laid. This This is something that, like, stereotypically, it's always been, like, nerds and weirdos and dorks are like socially inept and never have any like sexual experiences until they're like adults. And it's always like the jocks and cheerleaders who are hooking up and drinking and whatever. And the other straight edge kids, they never do that stuff. And as somebody who was in theater, that was the horniest group of people I've ever hung out with in my life. And that remains true even into adulthood. It is so horny. It is pure hormones, top to bottom. 
and everybody was fucking everybody else. There were so many like make out parties, spin the bottle turning into like just everybody hooking up with everybody else. It was mayhem. And I really appreciated him like emphasizing that in this song and talking about all of the different cliques and what they had going for them. Because, of course, the people who are not popular, there's enough of them that they fall into different groupings. So I really enjoyed George also, like, with his nerdy fucking dancing with this. Oh, my God. It's just... (sighs) He's wearing this, like, fleece, like, half zip. It's so goofy. I don't know why he's, like, wearing that either, because... They had been in totally different outfits earlier, but they put him in this. And I'm not really sure if that's like meant to be what he wore in high school, but maybe. Um, But yeah, he uh, says that we partied too and it's time you knew and goes through everybody and how they all handled their social interactions and the like news kids who were on the journalism team um, and the band kids, the theater kids, the art kids, and says something at one point about how the kids who went through this sort of thing and experienced shame and depression at a young age were more prepared for how shitty adulthood was than the people who had an easy time of it and then got out of, you know, their high school experience and found out that it was hard and it was a surprise. And this is a nice bit because on the one hand, I definitely think that's probably partially true. And on the other hand, they have a jock step up and be like, actually, my parents got divorced and it kind of destroyed me. And I'm really sorry that I lashed out at you and made fun of your band. And so I I like the fact that the show is like simultaneously like, yeah, people who like are a little bit more connected to their emotions can be left out of things sometimes. And it does sort of weirdly mentally prepare you, but that doesn't mean that people who are popular don't have any problems. That's not true at all either. Um, Rowan says, I was in a combo goth RPG ROTC group in high school. I know. Right. And they were super horny. Yeah. It's, it's out of hand. You guys like, it's really funny to me that, the stereotype about high school kids getting into trouble is often like, you know, underage drinking, smoking weed, driving too fast, partying. And it's like, nah, that's like the flashy type of getting into trouble. But you could get into trouble in so many other ways. And it looks legit from the outside because adults are looking for these other markers. And so you fly under the radar with some other shady shit, you know? Um, I really cannot emphasize enough. It didn't matter if you were like unattractive. Everybody was hooking up in the group of people that I hung out with. And there were people in that group that I was just like, "Mm -mm, no, I would never. They still got it in. Didn't matter. Bless them, you know? Um, so yeah, I really, really liked this, this song. While you played all those gendered sports, they got very co-ed. Uh, sports are overrated. They leave you red in the face while you were sliding into first the band kids rounded third place bass. And then we have a girl that's actually playing bass and it's so goofy. I really, I love how incredibly nerdy and weird this is. George is sort of like a sleeper character for me where he snuck up on me a little bit and I really enjoy him. He, every time he pops up, I'm like, I don't know about this guy. And then he wins me over. Um, one group that I will say that they didn't really talk about in this, uh, like we were popular song are the stoners because that was like a distinct group in my school. They were called the skaters, but really they were the stoners. And, uh, them I can't account for. I do not know anything about socially or sexually what their deal was, but they were a major factor in the social circles. They, you know, they definitely had their own whole thing going on, but it was something that I could not relate to. They wore Jinkos, they listened to Nirvana, they played hacky sack outside when we were having lunch, and that was their whole deal. 
Um, oh my God. And I need to mention too, that there's this running joke about how Hector promised that they would get two hour lunches because he had no idea all of the logistics involved in getting something like that passed. And, um, Josh kind of like needles him a little bit later talking about how lunches were only 40 minutes long. Guys, do you remember when you were in high school, how long your lunches were? Because I remember how long ours were. From the moment the bell rang to let us out of the previous class to the moment the bell rang, signaling the end of lunch and that we had to get up and leave was 25 minutes. So we had roughly five minutes to get to the cafeteria five minutes at least to like get our food. So we had 15 minutes max to eat. And it was the worst. I remember thinking that that was like totally normal. And then talking to my mother about like, first of all, our lunch was at 10am. And second of all, the fact that it ended at 1020. And my mom was like, wait, it's how long she was horrified. She got so mad. And like nothing, of course, wound up changing because that's a massive deal, as Hector found out. But 40 minutes, I wish. That's all I'm saying. I know some schools that just had like an hour, you know, because I'll see things like where uh, kids get to like go home at lunch, or people like leave school property and go to McDonald's at lunch. It's not even like whether we were allowed to go. We weren't. But even if we were, there would be no way that we'd go anywhere and get back in time. Not happening. Like, mm -mm. Um, I do enjoy that running joke about Hector, though. That is pretty fun. Uh, so let's see. I'm trying to see if there's anything I missed because I feel like I actually managed to cover everything, but I still have some time left here trying to see if there's no I think I talked about everything god I don't usually have that with this show because there's so many like sort of like emotional or life experience uh tangents that I go on and I'm sorry I made fun of your ska band I can't believe that I didn't say ska band specifically to George because of course he's super into ska my god I'm an idiot and what's really fun about it is this guy named Zach winds up being part of their dance for the rest of the song. And that's a really adorable thing. You were cool while we were not, but our massage circles were super hot. The massage circle thing, also very true. And also, I need to mention that when we see Josh in a massage circle saying how nice it is, Josh looks like he sucks at massage very, very much. He looks terrible at it. And he he just needs some lessons. He needs some pointers. Um... <laughs> so I'm just going to make sure so I, I'm under time, but I only have a couple of minutes left. So I don't want to get onto another huge tangent of any kind. I just want to scroll through real quick and make sure that I haven't missed anything super major. Um, I can't decide whether I really would like y'all's opinion on here. Josh's friends are saying that he's annoying. Do you guys think, that the rest of the class finds Josh annoying or is he just so likable in a general way that he wins them over despite the fact that he's like a bit much? I'm really curious because when you say so-and-so is popular, it's a really interesting thing that we, we call it that when the meaning of the word popular usually is most people like that person. But as we all know, being popular in high school does not mean that most people like you. It means that you possess the attributes needed to wield social power. Those aren't the same thing, but we call them the same thing. So like I had said at the beginning of this episode, Josh doesn't have that kind of power anymore because none of these people go to the same school are they just humoring him or do they have pleasant memories of him and they're like oh hey that guy yeah he's fun like maybe it just doesn't matter um rowan says massage circles were a thing at my church camp we were super horny there too episcopalians what could you do oh that's funny um i think it's likable if you don't have to be around it all the time oh true yeah that's true 
Uh, Rowan says, I think Josh was probably fine in small doses, but most people probably didn't want to hang out with him a huge amount of the time. So yeah, you're both kind of of the opinion. Josh is like pucker. And uh, everybody here is like fine with some pucker because they're like, oh, yeah, it reminds me of high school. But probably they would not choose the Josh Chan cocktail as their drink of choice. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, the, the, the phenomenon to me of like being popular and nobody actually liking you is really fascinating and sort of a bummer, you know, to realize that somebody can have social power, despite the fact that nobody actually thinks they are a good person or somebody that they want to be friends with. Um, and it's sort of interesting that in this episode, despite the fact that it's about a, a like high school reunion, there isn't really much about bullying or anybody who was like a particular dickhead turning up. It's all to do with characters that we already know and love. And so it makes sense. But I would kind of have liked for somebody to have turned up that it turns out everybody was like, oh my God, that fucking guy. And maybe see how they have changed since high school, or maybe they haven't changed, you know, just like a little something like that. Um, I, I do like the fact that Josh Chan got voted or Josh Chan, the fact that white Josh was the one who got voted prom King instead. Um, was he voted prom King? And Valencia was voted prom queen, prom queen, and he was supposed to be with her for his like title. Because at my school, we were they were package deals for um, what do you call it? Homecoming. You voted for a couple for homecoming, and for prom king and queen, they were wholly separate elections. And I have to assume that that was the same for this school. And so it would have been white Josh and Valencia, which honestly, I really would have enjoyed seeing how weird that would be because that would mean that Valencia was actually more popular than Josh himself, like Josh Chan. And I wonder if that would have like hurt him to know that his girlfriend was either more liked or at least just had more social clout, you know? Um, Lauren says, I think they were, uh, I think they both were prom king slash queen because they had a dance for that in one episode. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely think she was prom queen, but I couldn't tell whether or not it was a separate thing or if she got prom queen because Josh got prom king and they were dating. Do you know what I mean? Because like, depending on how it's set up, it may have been that she got carried into prom queen when maybe she wasn't voted prom queen herself. She didn't win, you know? Um, Rowan says we voted for individuals, not couples for all dance selections. Yeah. You know, I don't really know why we voted for couples for like homecoming, but not prom. It's sort of weird that we did it two different ways. Now that I think about it, it worked out because like our homecoming couple, um, were actually close friends of mine that I was so excited when they got selected because I thought that they were a little too nerdy to win. And then they did. And I was like, Oh, everybody actually was like kind of cool about it. But uh, had it been a separate election, I feel like she would have gotten queen and he wouldn't have gotten king. I wonder how much she managed to carry that for him. Anyway, just all these like, you know, you think back at high school and there's weird shit about that. Um, and I also do wonder, like, what would have happened if Valencia and uh, Father Bra had wound up hooking up? Because, I mean, Josh Chan, he was riding high, clearly, throughout high school. And to lose her in that fashion, that would have been a pretty big scandal in school, I feel like, you know, that's the kind of thing that you would remember years later, like, oh, my God, and I remember there was this whole thing, you know. Um, yeah, because there's just those couples in high school who are like the couple. And you keep track of them the way that people do with celebrities. And it's just it's like, it doesn't matter to anybody, but it just, it's a thing. Um, anyway, all right. I'm going to wrap up, but thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate Lauren commissioning this episode. Again, I'm sorry that the uh, live watch didn't go as planned, but forgive me. I did my best. And yeah, I really don't know what to expect for the rest of the season. I, uh, 
especially the fact that Greg is back now. Like, I can't tell how much that's really going to be emphasized or how much they're going to bring him back. Like, maybe every other episode. I don't know. I'm really glad Valencia seems like she's back until the end, though. That's good. I miss, I just, I just really like her. You know, she grew on me so much. Um, and I will never recover from the fact that I was like joking around about how much I just wanted her and Rebecca to actually be friends. And then that was what happened. Cause I just never expected it at all. It makes me really happy. I just, I'm still recovering. So, all right guys. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the coverage and I will be seeing you again. Let's see. When's the next one? March 5th. I will see you again for the next episode on March 5th. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.